Well, um, special welcome with any of you visiting with us this morning. I want to let you know we have a newcomers class coming up in five weeks, one of my favorite times as a body. So if you are new to Southside, I encourage you to come, just get to know um, different people in the church and our vision, different things that are going on. would love to have you come join us for that. Uh, the reminder, we'll keep pushing the men's retreat and the women's retreat. If you are visiting, you could save five years of trying to get to know people in, in one weekend. So I encourage you, if, if you're new, the hardest thing is to just walk in cold turkey. Uh, you will be loved, and it is going to be a sweet time in the Word of God and, and with each other laboring together. So I encourage you in both those upcoming things. This morning, we're going to continue in our study in Romans. If you will turn to Romans chapter 12. Such a rich chapter. Paul's appealing to us as children of God how to live worthy of our calling. I love God's gospel that our duty, our responsibility, our life to him is not a sword over our head, but with hands with holes in them saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. That is the therefore of Romans 12.1. In light of that gospel, the mercies of God, you have to get mercy to live Romans 12. You must understand the past mercies of God and what he's done in his son. You must understand the present mercies of a Christ interceding for us even this hour and the future mercy of what he's going to bring as he brings his kingdom to earth forever. This is our bedrock foundation that our lives are to be built upon. That you know the wrath of God was upon you for your sin and your ungodliness and your suppressing God who's made himself clear and evident from creation. There was nothing that you could do to get God's wrath off of you. Rubbing up against the law could only make it worse. Trying to clean yourself up and be a better person could not fix it. What the law could not do in Romans 8, God did in sending his son into this world. And Jesus came and he lived the life of righteousness. He died a death for our sins. He was buried and he was raised victorious. And he's now seated at the right hand of God, interceding for his bride. Christ is the gospel and we are justified. We are made right with God by faith alone in him. By the Holy Spirit who indwells us, we are joined to Christ by faith. If someone asks me, what is a Christian? It's the one who has the life of God in their soul. And the Spirit of God has been put within us, and we have been joined to Christ. And we now have that within our souls. In Him, we're no longer under the law. We're not in any way trying to perform a law to be right with God, but now we're under grace, who completely fulfilled that law in our place. Grace is the power to change us and transform us. We're brought into Romans 8, 28, that now we have a God who causes all things to work together for our good to those who have been called according to his purpose. We were brought into a love that he says we cannot be separated from. Nothing will come into your life that could ever separate you now from this love. We have a God who's sovereign over salvation, He's designed history, how to show mercy to Jew and Gentile. And so that from him and through him and to him are all things to God be the glory forever. Therefore, therefore, how does a person live then who walks out of a prison cell and does not sit in the electric chair, but you are pardoned by the warden's son who sat in it in your place? How do you walk out free? No condemnation, no charge can be brought against you again. How do you live? The answer is Romans 12. You, you love God and you love others. We offer up our body as a living sacrifice. Here you go, Lord, my life is yours. We quit living by the world's pressures and thoughts and what they treasure and what they call pleasure. And we renew our minds in the truth of God's word, which reveals Jesus Christ to us by the Spirit. We walk now into a body humbly by faith and we exercise the gifts that God has given each one of us to build each other up into the image of Jesus Christ in unity. We love without a hypocrisy. It's genuine. We abhor what is evil and we cling to what is good. 
We're devoted to one another in brotherly love and we give honor and preference. We're diligent and we're fervent in spirit as we serve the Lord because we love him. And we, last time we were together in Romans, we're rejoicing in hope and we are persevering in tribulation so that we can love one another. And now this morning, Paul's going to bring us to what I would call the fountainhead for every grace that's been described in Romans 12. What we realize quickly is I, I cannot produce any of Romans chapter 12 in my own strength. I, it just can't spring up in the soil of Ken Murphy, my efforts, my abilities, or my doings. And so where does the kind of life come from that we're studying and we've said by the word of God, by lingering over it, and there's times where we read it and you walk away and you feel unchanged, but you are storing up this foundation and this truth of who God is and his beauties and his mercies. We linger over the word of God and by his spirit, he is changing and metamorphosing us from one image of glory to the next. And now this morning, there's more. There's more to live Romans 12. And it's very simply by God's grace alone. It is by his doing, it's him causing me to will and to do his good pleasure. So how do I get the power to live a Romans 12 life? How can I rejoice in hope with so many hard things going on in my life and in this world? How can I persevere in tribulation? Anyone tired and wearing out in a prolonged trial or battle with sin and you just are weary? How? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 12, 12, that we're to be those who are devoted to prayer. And I just want you to get this. As I was praying before I walked up, God, make every soul in this church devoted to prayer. And I want you to get this for yourself and for each other, that we're a body devoted to prayer. And the simple answer, uh, it's a real answer. It's one that has carried the saints through every high and stormy gale for centuries. Since the blood that was shed on Calvary's tree by Jesus Christ, this is what it purchased for us. We, ha we have the favorable presence of God. He desires and, and works for our good. We have peace with God and we stand in grace. We now are brought into this place of the favor of God. You are accepted and loved by him. You have his power. You, you have favor with God. That is the key to being devoted to prayer. You can read a million books, and if you don't get this principle, you're not going to get it. So let's pray. Father, we come before you. I desire Romans 12 in my life and every life in this room. God, it's the only worthy response to a gospel this amazing. And, and, and love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. I pray, God, now that by your spirit, through these beautiful words that have been inspired by your Holy Spirit, God, that you would turn every heart in here completely devoted to prayer. Lord, don't let us play at it. Don't let it be our last resource. God, let in every heart that it is something we are devoted to. And I pray that you would do that now in every heart here this morning. Amen. <clears throat> I'm on a mission, so if I'm a little overpassionate, you tell me to calm down. Oh, man. I, I can't do any of these things myself, and only by God's grace that we can do these things. I, I just, I'm not a wind-up toy that God just winds up and says, go. I'm not Popeye. I don't eat spinach, and, and now I can go live the Christian life. He didn't give me all the grace I need. Here you go at salvation. I give you all the grace you need. Go live this abundant, God-honoring life. I'll see you in glory, my friend. But rather, God has given us the most amazing means there is to begin and grow into a Romans 12 kind of life. There is a power that is availed to the Christian to begin to be changed and to live this kind of life. And it is, it's not us. The only way to avail yourself to the power that is yours is in Jesus Christ through prayer. In John 15, Jesus said, there's this key to abiding in me 
and praying and, and abiding in Christ and praying for grace is where you're going to get this transformation that we're learning in Romans 12. That is the means that God has given to us, the children of God. And so if, if you were God's arch enemy and you hate his glory with every fiber of your being like the diabolos, the devil, and you have remaining sin that wants to love yourself and make yourself God, and you live in a world that promotes your strength and your right to live however you want, all these things are playing against you, what would you do? Well, you'd spend much of your time making sure that the children of God don't pray. You have all power from God for transformation. I'm going to keep you away from that all your days. If I'm your enemy, you are going to not go to the throne of grace for help. Let them gather. Let them sing songs. Let them listen to your word. Let them talk afterwards. Let them sharpen their knowledge. Let them even evangelize. Let them have people into their homes, but don't let them pray. Let them have a form of godliness and deny its power. Beautiful strategy. Why do you think that almost everyone here this morning, if I'd ask you to raise your hand, struggles with being devoted to prayer more than anything else in your life? Why do we all gather for Sunday worship and a handful gather for the prayer meetings? We love to study our Bibles but prolonged laboring at the throne of grace in prayer is rare and it's difficult because this is the power source to live the Christian life. This is what makes it supernatural. The Christian life begins with grace and it ends with grace and everything in the middle is grace. Uh, Spurgeon wrote a book called All of Grace. It is all grace. It is all his doing. And too many come to Jesus for grace at justification, what we call salvation. And they leave him and they look to their resolve, their unified strength together, their planning, and they don't look to him. I hate, I dislike the phrase, all I can do is pray for you. (laughs) No, I can pray for you. Spurgeon said the greatest thing you could do for anybody is to pray. To have someone pray for your soul is the best thing that someone could ever do for you. And I believe we have so little Romans 12 in our lives is because we're not devoted to prayer. We're, we're devoted to understanding the theology of Romans 12, and now I'm going to try to go live it in my own strength. You will not get there. It's going to come by being devoted to prayer. The great principle of prayer is that you can't live the Christian life without him. I'll I'll never be devoted to prayer till that breaks in. Apart from him, I can do nothing. I've got to get that into my heart, not just my head. I can do nothing without Jesus Christ. I can love nobody. I can serve nobody. I can't lead anyone to Jesus. You can't overcome sin in your life. You can't love your spouse. The bottom line is you can't breathe without God. So a saint without prayer is like a toy without a battery. It's like a car with no gas or a gun without bullets. Paul looks at the believers, this is be devoted to prayer. I love this word devoted. It means to persist at, to occupy oneself diligently with, to, to be devoted to it. Faith as I go to him for everything. There's nothing that I don't go to God for. I'm devoted to prayer. It's a great word, and it's worthy of our attention this morning. Why would Paul choose the word devoted? I think because it instantly reveals what prayer should not be for a Christian. It should not be just foxhole prayers. Whenever I get stuck, I throw up a prayer. It's not hit or miss. It's not just over a meal. It's not when I take a hard test. It's all those things, but it's everything. Devoted. This is the life and the breath of a believer. It's just who I am because of the gospel. Devoted. I'm so needy of his grace at all times, and so are the brethren. The the, the needs that Robert prayed for this morning, they're they're unbelievable. Uh, And that hits me 
uh, Alex Babinick, one of our members, is going in for um, a, a transplant of his cells for his uh, MS. They're just killing his whole immune system to try to reset it. And he goes in Wednesday, and I told him that as a church, we'd pray for him greatly during this time. So if you would be praying for Alex. I'm devoted to pray. I'm devoted to use my gift to build up anyone in this body. Devoted to love you without hypocrisy. And pray for that as you pull up and every time you walk into the gathering of any kind of saints. God, help me to forget myself. Help me to come into this group in love. Help me to abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Help me to be diligent and fervent serving the Lord. God, help me to rejoice in hope. It is unbelievable how many people are getting this and rejoicing in hope. I've never seen anything like this since I've been a minister. And God is just pouring out His Spirit where your hope is becoming clear and, and what you're shooting at, and it's, it's sustaining you in suffering, and it's causing you to persevere in tribulation. In, in tribulation, there, there is a grace to not give up or quit for those of you who are so tired and so weary. That pray, pray to persevere in tribulation. That is what our prayer chain is for. 24-7, you can send it out to all the saints and say, I need grace to persevere and rejoice and hope. I need you guys to pray that I could look to Christ and, and be held. I want you to get this. You cannot study this and say it's only by the Holy Spirit and walk away. Because metamorphosis will not happen that way. We need true transformation. And it's going to come by prayer. The Holy Spirit abiding in Christ and us praying and crying down grace for everything. He gives it to us. He, he, we stand in grace. We don't have to earn it and muster up his favor to get him to give it to us. He delights to give it to us. And he says, just ask and I'll give abundantly. You have not because you ask not. How many of you have been fighting in prayer for this kind of a life with the Lord? for you and for others? Have you been going to Romans 12, just storming the throne of grace? Help me be this kind of man, woman, or child. Help my neighbor to be this kind of man, woman. Every prayer request, that's where I'm going to take it. I want you to be these kind of men and women. Our prayers cannot just be God. Heal them. Heal them. God, give them grace to rejoice and hope and persevere in tribulation. And yes, if it be your will, as Robert prayed so beautifully, heal them. But I, I want them to get this gospel. I want them to get their hope, that the, their roots go deep into this hope and into Jesus Christ. Be devoted to this kind of prayer. It's used 10 times in Scripture, the word devoted. Five times it's used of prayer. Half of its usage is be devoted to prayer. In Acts 1.14, these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. Acts 2.42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking bread and to prayer. Acts 6.4, as they're appointing the first deacons, we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Colossians 4.2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert with an attitude of thanksgiving. I want you to listen to 1 Peter 4, 7 through 11. It ties Romans 12 perfectly. The end of all things is at hand. We're getting to the end. Therefore, be of sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. We need grace more than ever as you see the days are evil and increasing. We can't live in this world without His grace. But above all, keep fervent in your love for one another, which is Romans 12, because love covers a multitude of sins. So in the end days, most people's love is going to grow cold. And he's saying in these end days, stay fervent in your love for each other. Be hospitable to one another. I just heard a sermon on that last week. Be hospitable to one another without complaint. As each one has received a special gift, Romans 12, 3 through 8, Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Be devoted to prayer. 
I came across an interesting nuance of the word. It's used in Mark 3, 9. Listen to this. And Jesus told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the multitude pressing in in order that they might not crowd him. And so this word here carries the idea of having a boat ready for use in case the crowds come, Jesus can step into it. Nothing more needed to be done to the boat. It was to be ready. No other preparation is needed for immediate action. We're just, we're ready for prayer. We're we're ready. Nothing's to hinder it. Coldness, distance, stressed relationships. Be ready. A big part of prayer starts a long time before you pray. Be ready. Be devoted to dependence on God. Be devoted to God and his grace. And so as I come to this thought, devoted to prayer, I believe that a church truly devoted to this will see the power of God. Take prayer out and you're going to have dead orthodoxy. You're going to have a form of godliness and deny its power. It won't be people coming to Christ and being conformed to him in Romans 12. That can only be done by the grace of God. And we're all interceding on each other's behalf for this. We'll have a bunch of spiritual platitudes. We can debate doctrine. We can talk about what we're learning. But you'll quit doing. Uh, you, you can read every day, etc. But little looking at people who are being conformed to Jesus Christ like Romans 12. We don't want ritual. We want reality. And I don't want us doing Christian things without it flowing from Jesus Christ. And today in the church, more than ever, we have downloads and seminaries and radios and commentaries and logos. And and what's happening is we're becoming second-handers and we're not experiencing the power of God in our own personal devotions and time seeking his face. Prayer is communion with God and that is where this will take place. And so what I want to do with our time is I want to give you some practical helps to promote devotion to prayer. That's my prayers. I I, I want us to walk out with that. So come with me. If you've never had devotion to prayer, let's see what the Lord might do this morning. First, a quick note from last time. Last time I was preaching, I said, what does verse 12 have to do with love? You know, what's love got to do with it? And so in verse 12, we're like rejoicing in hope, Persevering in tribulation, right in the middle of love. And verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saint and practicing hospitality. And, and we said it has everything to do with it because when you rejoice in hope and you can't be moved away, you're, you're good for the body of Christ. You can help them in their trials and tribulations because you can point them to their real hope. And when you are persevering in tribulation and not closing up and pulling away from the body, you, you, you can be helpful. You can help the body of Christ. And so it's got everything to do with love. Well, what does being devoted to prayer have to do with love? It has everything to do with love. This is how we love each other. Our, our love would be manifested by praying for one another. You can't love me any better than praying. There's so much trial. Pray. Our praying for our own love to the body. Let me love this way, God. Let them love this way. Is there anything eclipsing your love for these blood-bought sinners in this room this morning? Then you need prayer. You need to be devoted to it. Do you know that God can do more in one prayer than we could do working for 10,000 years. You you could work your hardest for 10,000 years, and in two seconds, God could do more. So Lord, how do we grow in this? Well, this is my best attempt. And I think it could be as simple as this. Pray to God, help me to pray every day. God, help me to live in dependence and need of you in confidence, and that my first turn is to you. The answer, many times, will be God showing you your insufficiency. So what does tribulation bring into your life? It usually starts to show insufficiencies that I can't trust God in this. I'm weak. I need help. And so trials are so good to take away self-strength, self-confidence, to where I just, I need God. I need the every hour is the cry of my heart. And so seeing your lack of hope 
and, and, and realizing that God has to take away the things in my life that I'm really hoping in so that I'll, I'll begin to hope in what I should. And he's always working in each life to take away hopes that aren't him, that are not him. And so the answer, I just want you to hear this. When you say, God, help me pray, you're not going to wake up tomorrow like a spring chicken. I am ready to pray. My life's been changed. I, I, I prayed one time a week, and I'm just ready to pray every day the rest of my life. I can't, thank you, Jesus. He'll deal with what is keeping you from a devoted prayer life. There's something that's keeping you from it, okay? There, there, there's something. He's not just going to flip a switch, and now you pray. He's going to deal with what is in the way of a devoted prayer life. When I think of devoted It's not that I do it every second of every day, but it's a heart. It's a heart that gets this, my only hope. uh, And for you, the only hope is the grace of God. And uh, And the way that will get that is by the instrumentality of prayer. I get it. I'm devoted to it. My whole life with God, I've walked with God 35 years. You know what he's done? He's caused me to be devoted to prayer. I just want you to see that it just, that's what happens. And you're devoted to all kinds of prayer. We're committed to the secret place where I meet with God. Sitting at your desk with a prayer chain, bringing these requests to God. Praying in your community group. And one thing, this is for free. Um, we're going through this call to mission in Sunday school. And what I want in each community group is that there is in prayer requests there's a time to bring up someone you're sharing your faith with. So as a group, we're we're praying for souls. And so in in your community groups, prayer groups, corporate prayer during the service, when we close the service this morning, I'm going to pray for you and, and all of us join our hearts together and pray together in corporate prayer. A prayer meeting on Saturday night while I'm preaching when you hear of a need, when you see a need, I just, what I want is we're devoted to prayer. We are devoted to it. What do I run to when I have a need? Um, Prayer. Are you with me? Devoted, as opposed to random, occasional, sporadic, and intermittent. Okay, you you can do intermittent fasting, but not intermittent prayer. (laughs) God is our Father who's available to us all the time. And I've learned any relationship suffers if you only call it when there are emergencies. And so it's, it's a relationship. And it's, it's a constant fellowship, communion, and crying down grace for every need that I have in my, my brethren. And so here's what I want to do as we close, is turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 because I'm just seeing every subject and connection that we're seeing in Romans 12 in this chapter, but with a little more fleshed out teaching on the prayer part. And so I want to go and flush that out just a little more, and then we will pray. Ephesians 1.15. Paul says, for this reason, the gospel, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, saints in Ephesus, and your love for all the saints. I do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you, saints, a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. And we've talked about this word, epinosis. It's not just academic knowledge. It's the knowledge of God. It's experiential. And so I'm praying that you'll just get Jesus and you'll know him and you'll understand and commune and have the wisdom of the gospel and the revelation of of all that is in Christ. And so Paul's praying, I pray that you get the full knowledge and revelation of Jesus Christ. And then look with me. Uh, Really, that is Romans 1 through 11. So The epinosis was Romans 1 through 11. It's the gospel, and it's getting it. It's going beyond the academic to where your It's a heart knowledge, and that's where we're going to go next. So your deepest need is to know Christ. 
guess what? It's not your health, wealth, and prosperity. Your deepest need is Jesus, to know him. And that should be what's prayed for the most. I want to know you. And, and Paul said that, that I may know him. We need a spirit of wisdom and revelation. When I studied Revelation 5 a few weeks ago at the communion table, I, I just had a spirit of revelation. When I was studying that, I just, the beauty of Jesus was jumping off the pages at me. And it eclipses everything that trumps my love for God and others in chapter 12. So we got competing desires uh, to, to live selfishly or to live Romans 12. And I pray for the spirit of revelation spirit to know him. Pray this for each other. Give him epinosis of Jesus Christ. And then Paul narrows it down to three specific things to pray for each other. And he says in verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Kids, did you know that your hearts have eyes? They have eyes. It, 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 this is really interesting to me. The, the eyes in your head can't see Jesus. Isaiah said he walked among us and we didn't discern him. We, we could not discern Jesus. John said the light came in the world and we didn't comprehend it. We've been waiting thousands of years for promised Messiah and we couldn't see him with our eyes. They couldn't get it. Judas saw him and all his power, everything that Jesus did, and he couldn't see him. He betrayed him for 30 cents. Just couldn't see him. And so now, as believers, he says, let there be light. And now he's saying, your soul, your heart has eyes to see Jesus now, and you love him. We have eyes. We read the Bible, and now we see Jesus. I read it growing up, and I saw nothing. It was just like any other book that I read. Just same thing. And, he, and the Spirit comes and sheds abroad, and now you have epinosis. You can see Jesus. You have spiritual apprehension. You see his glory, and you love it. You can taste it. It's beautiful. And he says, now with those eyes of your heart, I'm praying for three things that they'll see to be enlightened. And he, and he says in verse 18, so that you will know what is the hope of of his calling, which is what we've been laboring in in Romans, I pray that God would open your eyes to really know what is your true hope. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance and the saints? I just wish that you knew what's coming. You wouldn't have to get everything here on earth if you knew your inheritance and what's awaiting for you. And I pray that you would know the surpassing greatness of God's power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under the feet of Jesus and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. So get this. You can't get to glory without his power. There is no way to go from here to glory without the power of God. You cannot rejoice in hope without this opening my eyes to see it. You can't persevere in tribulation without his power. You're going you're gonna to quit. You're going to give up and go walk away like others have. I can't get to my inheritance in my own strength. Just write that in your notes. You cannot get to your inheritance in your own strength. Are you convinced of that? Or does God need to convince you some more with trials? Because in love, he will. So my prayer is, Lord, don't let me become cold to your word and who's revealed in it, Jesus Christ. Give me that epinosis. So that I, I, I don't want to spend my life and my time on me and my hobbies and my interests I don't want to drift and make Denver paradise. I'm just so afraid of that. And so I pray, let me see Christ and what he's purchased for me. God, let my hope be anchored to Jesus. And let this anchor me in all the hard things that are going to come upon me and that are blowing right now in my life. The hard things, I'm anchored to Jesus Christ. God, give me this so that I will spend my life on what matters and loving you and loving other people. 
And God will answer that prayer. And he'll anchor you to the anchor, Jesus Christ. So guys, may we be devoted to prayer. And open the eyes of my heart, Lord, as I read your word and hear sermons and studies and come with this heart. Let me see. I want to see Jesus. So I want to go to the bottom line application for you this morning. This is what I observe in my own heart and in other people that I shepherd. We have a sin. And that should be every one of you like, amen. Amen. That had to be John. We run to what is the theology of my problem. And then we run to wiser people because the Bible told us to. And we go, we ask everybody who's wise, how would you handle this? What would you do? How do I get to the root of my sin? Pastor always tells us, go to the root, not just the flower. So uh, what's my root? And then what are the things that trigger this sin? Let me figure out, you know, when I do this, when I do that, it triggers it. And then he makes me go further. What's the idol of my heart? What is it that I'm not believing about God and hoping in something else in this world? What am I not believing about the gospel? And those are awesome. They must be done. I'm not down on one of those things. I don't think so. No. No. But what's missing? Sherlock Holmes? Yeah. Devoted to prayer. I do everything else that the Bible says, and I'm, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to conquer sin. There's all these ways of doing it. Give me my 10 steps, and I'll get it. So then, then I can say, look at, look at me. Look at my power. Look at my hands. Aren't they great? This is what we got to get, as we are devoted to prayer And it's not the last thing, it's the first thing that I, with anything I'm battling, any sin, any temptation, any trial that's over, I'm devoted to prayer. I don't run to everybody else. I run to God. And I might go to other people, no problem. But my concern is too many of us run to humans first. And that's why we're not growing the way we want to. Because no human can conform you to Jesus Christ. But being devoted to prayer can. And there's grace and there's power to have a hope beyond this life. To make that your true hope. And to overcome sins that are tempting you to make this your heaven. That's there. And that's why we're devoted to prayer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for for all of us now. Turn back to Romans 12. And this is going to be corporate prayer where I don't want you thinking about lunch. I want you joining me at the throne of grace with God. And we're going to come together and we're going to pray corporately right now as the body of Christ. But I want you to hear this as we begin. Never mind. I've gone too long. Come with me to the throne of grace. You really want to hear? No. Um, here, here, here's my burden. You might not want to hear it, but there's... I'll share it later, next week. Let's pray. Come join me, brothers and sisters. Father, we come before your throne on, on only one ground the shed blood of Jesus Christ on our behalf. The one who fulfilled your law, perfect righteousness. That righteousness brings us before your throne blameless with great joy this morning. God, we stand in the presence of Almighty God in grace. We stand in grace. And I thank you for that. And I pray that every saint in here has a therefore. Or if there are any unbelievers who've come into our midst this morning, they would see Jesus Christ hanging on a cross, taking the sword of justice from you, Father, 
right through the heart for their transgressions. Justice had to be satisfied. I pray, give them eyes to see that. Let the eyes of their heart see what Jesus has done to take their sins and separate them as far as the east is from the west. Let them believe. Give them faith. Let them look to Jesus and live this morning. And let the saints of God be overwhelmed with your mercies. Holy Spirit, shine on Jesus. Let us see him again in all his glory. Let our hearts be so full that all we want to do now is offer up our bodies to you, a living sacrifice. I pray for everyone in this room, God, that we would give the offering that you want. Here's my heart, Lord. Take what is yours. I pray, God, don't let us be conformed to this world. Help us to quit taking on its image and its thinking and its desires and its wants. But metamorphose us, God. Transform us by the renewing of our mind and the truth of your word. By the Spirit of God shining the floodlight on Jesus Christ. Metamorphose us so that we can know what is the will of God. And I pray, God, through this grace that you've given to us, grace gifts, that there would be no one in here thinking more highly of themselves than they ought to think. God, that we would come in here in profound humility, wanting to use anything that you've put within us for the good of our brothers and sisters. Let self die. Let humility be the aroma of Southside Bible Church. And let us use these gifts to bring grace into each other's lives to be conformed to Jesus Christ. God, please purify our love. We're so prone to selfish love. We're prone to hypocritical love, but by this gospel, Lord, there is a way to begin by your spirit to love without hypocrisy. Would you grow that in each one of us this morning? God, that we would quit using people, but we would be used for people. God, I pray, let that love abound. Lord, we live in a culture that is decaying. Help us to love you so much that we abhor evil. God, we don't play with it. We don't smile at it. We don't say, oh, I'm, I'm benign to that. God, we, we abhor it. Grow a holy hatred in every one of our hearts for evil and let us cling to what is good, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Let us give preference to one another in honor. Let us not fight to be noticed or appreciated or, or admired. God, we come to wash feet. Grow us to give preference to others. I want you to be held up so I can be held down. Lord, grow us in that spirit that is contrary to our age. God, let us not lag behind and diligent and be fervent in spirit serving you. Let our love to you just not be quenched. Let it be an unquenchable fire to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Wake us up if we're apathetic, meandering, cold, drifting. Let us look at this gospel and may you take the embers and just stoke them again to serve the King of Kings. Lord, let everyone in this room rejoice and hope. Let it be as certain as we're standing here this morning what is coming for those who have loved the Lord Jesus Christ. God, let us quit trying to fix and have paradise here. Please let us all lose our lives for the one that's coming. Help us to persevere in tribulation, God. We are tired. We're an afflicted bunch. I pray, let us persevere because, because of your grace and your strength. Bring us to the finish line, O oh God. Let us be a group devoted to prayer, to, to be at your throne of grace often, looking for help for ourselves and for each other. Thank you that, that your grace cannot run out. It's infinite. It's for us. God, let us use it. Transform us by your power, we pray. And let us contribute to the needs of the saints. Let, 
Let each other's needs be our needs. Let us have fellowship with anyone who has a need in this body. And let us open our homes and our lives to bring people in to love and nurture and help and grow and give them a safe place in such a stormy world. God, I bring all these things before you this morning. Would you make us into these kind of people by your power? And may we storm your throne until we see these being metamorphosed into our lives. And so thank you for these words of truth. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, the life of God and the soul of man. And thank you that we have abundant, eternal, overflowing grace of help from our God for this kind of transformation. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.